And we've already talked about different forms of cartels as, and as the time go, as the term is going along, farm price supports and all the rest of it. We will now go go again to various various types of cartels the government enforces. So internal pressure and external pressure have broken up every cartel. Um, Without exception, the only cartels which have lasted have been government cartels, like OPEC, which is the first cartel of different governments. Even, even OPEC is finally busted after, what is it, 13 years, 12, 12, 13 years. Even they couldn't hack the fact that new, new countries were coming in with new production. Britain and, and Mexico and so forth, which are not part of OPEC, which tended to bust the whole thing. So, so economic law works even with governments, and certainly with private firms, it works much faster. <clears throat> Uh, now, one of the successful cartels uh, is the Diamond Cartel. Um, the, even that has not been that successful recently. The diamond, what happens in diamonds is all wholesale diamonds are rooted through South Africa. Uh, the Beers uh, Company in South Africa, which then sells, hotel di- uh, sells wholesale diamonds to the diamond markets in Amsterdam, etc. But they... Huh? Rotterdam. Rotterdam. Amsterdam, Rotterdam. Yeah. And they... <laughs> And they sell, I think Amsterdam too is a big, is a big diamond center. And they sell, they regulate the flow, and they keep the supply drastically limited uh, through the Beers cartel. Now what's happened to, several things happened to that cartel. First place, a few years ago, the whole, the whole diamond market busted. The demand curve collapsed, and the di- price of diamonds went way down. So even the cartel, a world diamond cartel, is not all powerful, because it has to face consumer fluctuating, consumer... Uh, desires, etc. Other jewelry, you know, all sorts, of, all sorts of jewels in a sense are competing with diamonds. Um, another thing is this, is the reason why De Beers is able to do this, because South Africa has a, most of the diamonds are found in South Africa. I was going to say grown. <laughs> anyway, they're discovered in South Africa. The way South African government enforces this, it's done by the South African government, not by the Beers. The Beers is the beneficiary. The way they do it is this. In South Africa, all diamonds, all diamond land is nationalized. In other words, if you're a farmer, you're Joe Jones or Yap Schroeder or whoever it is in South Africa, okay, and you find diamonds in your land, those diamonds are now part of government owned. They immediately become part of the government. The whole diamond mine or ore or whatever is nationalized. Okay, so, so first South African government nationalizes all the diamonds. Then they lease the diamonds to favored lessees. They lease the mines. To who? To the beers, basically. In other words, the beers have to get the monopoly, let's see, plus a few other large diamond firms are in with the cartel, which is essentially an ally to the beers. Nobody else can get a license to, 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 to mine diamonds. So if you're a farmer, you're a you and you decide, well, the hell with the government monopoly, I'm going to sell these diamonds. Uh, you're shot, I mean, literally shot, because they, they patrol the coast of South Africa, it's patrolled with the coast, coast Guard. Very rigorous patrol that catch so-called diamond smugglers. These diamond smugglers people are trying to get their own diamonds out, basically. And uh, to sell them, to break the cartel, their coast is patrolling, they're shot. There was, a, there was a good British film a few years ago, uh, uh, some big star in it, about the diamond, South African diamond business. And, and it talks about this. It's, of course, it doesn't go into the cartel part very much. It talks about being shot by the Coast Guard and all that. So diamond smuggling, quote-unquote, is really people trying to, trying to gauge in free trade, is what it really amounts to. <clears throat> um, try to bust the cartel. So in other words, the successful cartel, first of all, it's not too super successful because the consumers can lower the price and have done it. Second of all, it's only successful because the gov- South African government enforces it through this kind of arrangement where the, the Beers is leasing the, la- the diamond mines from, they don't own the mines, they lease it from the South Af- African government, which automatically owns it. Um, so uh, a f- about 10, 20 years ago, Russia discovered, Soviet Russia discovered diamonds. So it was a big panic in the international diamond cartel. What, what are we going to do? Russia might bust the market, bust the price, you say. Russia, however, being monopolists themselves, in this case state monopolists, were very happy to get cut in as a part of the quota. In other words, they were happy to get cut. So Russia sells the, their diamonds to the South African government cartel, <laughs> even though allegedly are opposed to the South African government politically. When it comes to business, it all, it all is a happy combination of monopolists. In other words, they got a chunk of the, of the, of the quota, so to speak. Um, so that's the mystery of the, of the, whenever you see a successful cartel, look to government enforcement, and, and sure enough, there's where it was. <clears throat> um, another thing that's come into the, uh, the news yesterday was the fact that heroic, one of my heroes in the movies, Clint Eastwood, became mayor of Carmel, <laughs> California. Okay. Uh, elected by, by two and a half to one, 70%, kicking out the, the 
previous mayor. Now, the issue in which he fought, fought the, the race on was very simple. It was anti-government cartelism. In other words, the town, if you've ever been to Carmel, it's a beautiful little town on the, on the Pacific. It's been a tight, tight, tight stranglehold of, of a bunch of upper-class liberals who essentially are residing in the town and run it, keeping down all growth. In other words, they're trying to prevent any kind of expansion, any kind of, uh, any kind of, uh, business growth or whatever. So they, in other words, the whole thing is sort of a big zoning monop, zoning cartel. The zoning laws are used as a way of restricting production, keeping supply of almost everything to the left, supply of houses, supply of trade, merchants, stores, whatever. So Clint Eastwood owned a restaurant in Cartel and Carmel. What he wanted to do is expand it. He wanted to get permission to expand it a little bit. They refused to do it. They have a very severe anti-growth policy in Carmel. If you've ever been to Carmel, you see why. And so they, uh, he, he, he ran on a, on a basis of a free market ticket. In other words, to bust the, uh, the anti-growth zoning cartel is what it really amounts to. He doesn't use the word cartel, but that's what it is. The, uh, so he mobilized the masses and ran came and <laughs> won by two to one. So at any rate, this is so they, what you have all through the United States, on a local level and on a federal level, is, is this kind of compulsory cartel in various areas. Um, in this case, it's compulsory housing and zoning cartel is what it amounts to. Um, California, by the way, is shot with that. I mean, it's shot through with housing cartels. You try to keep out people you don't like by, by zoning them out of existence, or zoning them, preventing them from coming in, what it amounts to. Uh, the, um, okay, the another, uh, Another case of uh, Costa Rica cartel is, uh, well, the there's a whole bunch of cases. Licensing in general uh, is, um, there's a um, example of every business, almost every business is now licensed. I mean, everything you can think of. And the licensing is always the, the excuse for license. What's the excuse? The excuse, of course, is the public welfare, common good. The excuse is we have to protect the public by licensing this profession. Uh, well, the medical profession, they have a, they, it sounds more plausible than other professions. It's not the only, it's not the real reason for medical licensing either. But in some cases, it's obviously idiotic. Like, photographers are licensed. Why do you have to have only licensed photographers? My, my brother-in-law, for example, is an excellent photographer. Um, he doesn't, um, he doesn't have a license, because the license is very expensive. He's in the state of Virginia. So the license is very expensive. Okay, so you have an expensive license. This, of course, pushes the supply curve of photographers to the left and raises the price of the consumer. He would like to be a part-time photographer. Okay, he's, he's really a printer. A photographer is a sign line. He's a very good one. He could be, a, but he can't, he doesn't, he doesn't have enough money to be a license. It it's not worth his while to have, get a full license. So they don't have a Gestapo in Virginia searching every town for photographers. So he can, he can be an illegal photographer, except he can't take out, he can't take out an ad. He can't have, be on the yellow pages. He can't say photographer, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because then he'd be, and the state licensing bureau cracked down on him. His business is restricted by the fact that he can't advertise and he can't he can't make it public. So this is what happens. The purpose of and, and the purpose of licenses is to keep out, uh, to push the supply curve to the left, keep out new entrants. You know what I mean. And one one of the things about licenses we'll see time and again here, is, and, and Miller mentions this, is so-called grandfather clause, grandfathering. Uh, grandfather clause means that you you. You say, <clears throat> this profession, whether, whatever it is, <clears throat> this occupation, needs to be licensed because we have to serve the public and have to be, make sure, for example, photographers are of good moral character or they're heavily educated, whatever the heck it is. Okay? They've taken three years of courses in some photography school. <laughs> well, these restrictions are coming. They're not applied to, to existing people. Existing people are grandfathered out. In other words, let's say you, you pass a law in, in Virginia that in order to be a photographer, you have to, get, you have to go two years of photography school. Okay. Licensed photography school, which is very expensive. This pushes the supply curve to the left. And then you say, existing photographers are exempt from this regulation. So this is a blatant, monopolistic, cartelistic thing. Now, it was obviously, it has nothing to do with the public welfare, because if you want to serve the public welfare, you apply to everybody, including to existing photographers. It's really important that photographers get a university education, or they get learn about physics or something like that. Uh, then you make it apply to everybody. No, it only applies to new people coming in. That's the tip-off. The whole thing is a racket. The grandfather clause is a tip-off to the racketeering nature of licensing. Now, for example, in the barbering profession, <laughs> what they do is, you see, every 20 years or so, they increase the, the requirements because the new generation comes in. They want to be grandfathered, too. 
So every 20 years or every 15 years, there's a big increase in tightening of requirements in almost every profession. Barbering is a marvel. I, I unfortunately lost the clipping. There's a great little story about barbering, history of barbering. Initially, of course, you don't know, barbers are not licensed. You become a barber. Let's say you, you cut hair and that's it. If you're, good, if you're a lousy haircutter, you go out of business. If you're a good haircutter, you stay in business. At any rate, the barbers got together and in a guild and they began to lobby for licensing. <clears throat> And every 10 years, they raise the restrictions. In other words, initially, you have to go for six months to a barbering school. And then 10 years later, you have to go a year to a barbering school. I think now it's like three and a half years to barbering school. You have to pass courses in the, in the history of barbering. <laughs> like, if I have to take 104 here, right? <laughs> history of barbering, the, the, tech, the barbering technology in the 1600s. <laughs> now, you have to pass courses in the ethics of barbering, as if barbering has its own ethics. <laughs> you don't cut the guy's neck, I guess, let's say. Anyway, you know, <laughs> huh? That's right. That's like one It's like any it's tightening of requirements, and and in each case, the existing people are exempt. Now, in each case, you say, well, from now on, everybody's got to pass a course in the history of barbering, but the existing barbers don't have to do it. But again, it's a tip off, it's a racket, and um, and so every every five or ten years, they keep increasing the requirements. You have to be a citizen. The, the minimum age keeps going up. It used to be 16 or 17, now it's about 21 or something like that. They keep raising the age, increasing the educational requirements. You have to be a citizen, and God knows what. There's all sorts of ways to restrict entry into the profession. <clears throat> um, in Chicago, but the thing of Chicago is a, high, is a very heavy unionized town, much more than New York, and much, much more uh, guild, guild operated. In Chicago, technically, on, technically, if the law were really followed, it'd be illegal to shave yourself without a license. Because it says in order to shave anybody, if anybody, you have to have a license. And so only licensed barber can shave people. So technically it's illegal to shave yourself uh, in Chicago. And I can see the Gestapo in Chicago breaking into everybody's home. You're shaving yourself. You're under arrest. <laughs> you're not a licensed barber. So fortunately, of course, these are not enforced, these, these insane requirements. But they're part of the law. You know, a lot of people think if it's part of the law, it should be enforced of the hilt. Well, that's, that's part of the law in Chicago. It's not being enforced of the hilt. There's a lot of laws like that, by the way, which are crazy laws which simply have died out, even though they're still on the books. But this just shows you how far the licensing situation goes. For example, if your photography has to be, or any, most of these, like, you have to be certified as a good moral character. What does that mean? What do you, what do you, some board of, some board of photographers in Virginia are certifying everybody as good, what do they know about moral character anyway? <laughs> Why are they experts in morality? <laughs> but all this is part of this whole gimmick. Yeah? Does that mean that anybody wants no, it depends on each, each, each occupation. I mean, some are, for example, in New York, they're constantly trying to crack down on peddlers. I might have mentioned this before. That's part of the whole thing. See, the, 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 um, see part of the, one of the things I have to want to tell you about competition, it's not necessarily true that small businesses can be outcompeted by big business. In many areas, small businesses are more efficient are better able to compete than big businesses. For example, retail, the retail profession, retail, retailing in general. Peddlers can often outcompete retail stores because peddlers can come in when it's, they're not there on the corner when it's raining. They have a lower, lower capital requirement. They don't have to pay rent. They have to pay fixed, they have fixed equipment, right? They can nip in with one day supply of purses or scarves and sell it. And if it's raining, they don't show up. So they're mobile, highly mobile. And they can often outcompete uh, retail stores to the extent that retail stores are always trying to outlaw them. And putting and insisting on special licenses on peddlers, hot dog stands, or whatever. So many of these guys are constantly, every once in a while, the mayor, whoever the mayor is, announces a crackdown on peddlers. Peddlers are great. I think peddlers are fantastic. They're cheaper. The stuff is, of course, much cheaper. We have in our neighborhood, for example, a magnificent florist, an illegal florist who's been selling flowers in St. Corner for many years. I mean, you go to an, to an official licensed florist and a, 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 a bouquet or something costs ten bucks. For him, it's a dollar and a half. It's magnificent. Plus, he's got better, fresher stuff. So the organized florists are trying to always keep them, put them out of business. They get the cops on. Of course, in the country, and then, of course, he pays off the cops. So there's a, con <laughs> there's a contest between who gets, you know, the official, official pressure. And every once in a while, the mayor says, we've got to crack down on the peddlers. What's wrong with the peddlers? Well, he, he, he says they're, they spoil the beauty of the New York City streets. It's great. I mean, New York City has many advantages, but beautiful streets is not one of them. <laughs> okay. So the whole thing is obviously an absurd argument that you use, any sort of argument, because of the pressure of retail, inefficient retail stores who can't compete with these guys. So it's not, and, and peddlers are the smallest possible business. They have one day supply of capital. Uh, in some cases, all they have is like a suitcase. 
They spread out the stuff and that's it. They don't even have a push cart. Push cart is already a high status symbol in the peddling profession. It means you have enough money to buy a push cart. <laughs> and yet they're magnificent. It's a great way to, for, for, for immigrants to, to, to um, rise up in the world. It had, had been in the past before licensing. And also a great way to compete. I mean, it's marvelous for the consumer and for, for, and for those who want opportunity. But of course, organized retailing, and organized retailing, by the way, has always been trying to outlaw their comp competition. It's been going on for 100, over 100 years. Every innovation in the retail industry, every successful technological innovation has been combated legally by the organized interests in the retail field. For example, in the uh, mid-19th century, when, when, when railroads first came in, okay, when the first time we had cheap transportation, <coughs> uh, and over land. And so when railroads came in, the institution of traveling salesmen came in, where, where stores, wholesalers in New York, let's say, or Chicago, would, would send traveling salesmen out with sample cases to show to the various retailers. Well, the organized wholesalers, let's say in you know, Dayton, Ohio, th didn't like the fact that traveling salesmen were suddenly popping up, you know, comp competing with them. In other words, New York uh, uh, stores can now compete uh, with uh, or wholesalers, can now compete with Dayton. So they had taxes to put them out of business, special license fees. They said they were evil, they were terrible things, unfair competition to have traveling salesmen. And this, by the way, is the reason, the origin of traveling salesmen, dirty traveling salesmen jokes, because traveling salesmen are usually in a state of illegality, because they're trying to evade $1,000, for example, they would have to pay like $1,000 a year license fees to operate in each town, and they're only making about 3000 a year, so, so obviously they couldn't pay it, so they... They try to slip in and out of town unseen, you see, before the retail the wholesaler can get after them, um, the wholesale competitors. So for about 20 or 30 years, the traveling sales were basically illegal. And finally, the Supreme Court says it was unconstitutional, and, the, and they were finally relieved of this, these special taxes and license fees. Uh, then after they, they were finally absorbed, and, and the wholesalers and they started employing traveling salesmen, you see, too. So the, the whole thing began to finally get accepted. Then after they were accepted, uh, around 1890 or so, a new institution comes in, the department store. And that was hysteria directly against terrible, unfair competition is more than one floor. Terrible thing is selling more than one product and blah, blah, blah. Outlaw them, tax them. So about 20 or 30 years, there were special taxes placed on department stores and attempts to outlaw them. And, uh, and then the same thing happened with mail order. My God, mail order. They can buy stuff by mail, Sears Roebuck and uh, Montgomery Ward. They don't even have to hire salesmen. That's unfair. Because they can just send catalogs out. They can sit there in Chicago and sell you stuff. Terrible thing, because consumers loved it. But all over the United States, there were bonfire par parties to burn Sears Roebuck catalogs. It would be unfair competition, <coughs> organized by the rotten retailers in each area, who, who claim they're going to be put out of business by evil Montgomery Ward and evil Sears Roebuck. Finally, they were accepted. Okay, and then comes the chain stores. The same damn thing happens to them. About 1920s, the first chain store started. A&P was the major chain. Liberals were calling for breaking up A&P. A&P is a monopoly. They're evil. Break them up uh, because they can sell stuff at a, a cheaper because they're getting discounted, you know, volume discounts. They can buy stuff cheaper. When I was growing up, there was, there was a liberal, liberals in the United States were calling for the breakup of A&P. Well, that was finally rendered obsolete by the supermarkets, which came in. A&P, of course, the last people to understand the importance of the supermarket, the last people to clue in on it. They were still, you know, mired in the old chain store technology, and so they... They, they, they fell behind. They were outcompeted by, by these new, newcomers like Safeway and Grand Union and so forth. And uh, if you, even now, even right now, A&P stores are usually the worst in the city. They still have the, the crummy wooden floors and all the rest of it. It's the dirtier. And so they, were, they, took them, they almost came, went out of business. They almost went bankrupt, so-called monopolists. They didn't have to be broken up. They fell behind in the competitive race because like most big business, many big business, I should say, they, they didn't understand the new, they weren't alive to new developments. The chain was a, well, chain is, well, supermarkets can also be a chain, but the chain was, you had mom and pop stores, okay? We go to the counter, you ask for two pounds of butter or something, okay? There are very few of them left. There's some neighborhood stores like that still. The chain stores, you had, um, you still had to go to the counter and ask them, but they were, you know, different, there were branches all over the place, and each one was more impersonal. You didn't have, you couldn't get credit as well. They were cheaper. On the other hand, you couldn't get credit. They didn't know you and that sort of stuff. You know, the deliveries weren't as, so there are trade-offs. I mean, a lot of people still prefer the mom and pop stores to get cheaper credit that can deliver it at night or whatever it is. But then you see when supermarkets came in, it was purely self-service, which was a great, tremendous new concept after World War II. It was completely unheard of. You didn't have to go and ask the guy to get the stuff. It was a great, great development. And A&P fell behind on that. Yeah, they finally did it, sure. But they almost went bankrupt. In fact, they, 
reduced a lot of their stores uh, because of that. So, um, at any rate, uh, so in the reach, and, and after that, after after the uh, chain stores are finally accepted, and the supermarkets are accepted, then they started belly aching about discount houses, which were the last big innovation in the 60s, 1950s and 60s. They used to have, I get they had, this is by the way, is put in by the trade by the retail associations, trade associations. Uh, resale price maintenance laws came in in the 1930s as an alleged anti-depression device, and of course, continued 30 years after the depression was over. Resale price maintenance laws meant that if a manufacturer signed a contract with a retailer, let's say, to sell some appliance for a certain amount, for a certain minimum price, let's say, sell an electric shaver for no less than $30, then no other retailer could cut the price any place, even though he, he, he wasn't bound by any contract. The law then imposed a minimum price for these products for all retailers all over the country. This is the so-called resale price maintenance law. Um, so why not? A manufacturer really doesn't care. Why should a manufacturer, if you're, if you're a sunbeam company, you're selling shavers, why should you care what the retail price is as long as you get your price that you want from the wholesaler or the jobber? And so they didn't, of course they didn't care. What happened was the organized retail associations went to sunbeam and said, look, we'll boycott you. We won't buy sunbeam unless you impose a minimum price of whatever it was, $30 or whatever. So in other words, the whole idea was to restrict production and raise price. And uh, inefficient retailers wanted to screw the consumer by ha organizing a cartel and getting the federal government and state governments along with them uh, imposed the cartel through resale price maintenance laws, which said once the manufacturer announces the price, everybody's committed to it. Retailers can't cut it. <clears throat> so uh, finally what happened was that two heroic so-called discount houses in, in New York, Masters and Corvette, uh, simply started cutting prices. They said, hell with it. We defy the law. We, we, we challenge the constitutionality of it. They started selling stuff way below, much cheaper. And the way they were able to do it is by no frill salesmanship, of course. In other words, the, instead of having a salesman at your beck and call, and what do you want, sir, et cetera, you, didn't, you had to line up like you do now with, you know, 47th Street photo, et cetera. You just... You know what you have to know what you want ahead of time. You're going and line up and, and pay for it. And so uh, that was enable them to cut the cost, to cut the price. And so they, they started undercutting. It was magnificent. So everybody flocked, of course, the masters and Corvette and went out to the Supreme Court. The retailers, organized retailers, fought it bitterly. They hated this thing. It's horrible. It's unfair and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's monopolistic. Here's another fa favorite argument of these, of these guys. They say, well, look, if you allow free competition, and cartelists always say, if you allow free competition, eventually... Some firms will get very big and they'll put the other firms out of business and then they'll raise the price. In other words, their argument is to, to, to preclude the, pro the possibility of an, of an efficient monopoly 20 years from now, which will eventually raise price, let's enforce an inefficient monopoly right now. <laughs> so let's have a government cartel forcing you to raise the price. An obviously idiotic argument, which can only be held by somebody who's doing this for, for the, you know, to impose an inefficient cartel on their own behalf. I mean, I, if you look at it logically, the whole thing is idiotic. So it's, you know, it's only pushed by people who are special pleaders for this thing. <clears throat> so um, this is their argument. If you, if you can't, it'd be a terrible thing. Larger retailers will take over and they'll be efficient. They'll finally eventually raise the price. Of course, they eventually never come. Prices get lowered by competition. So at any rate, this kind of the masters of Corvette were hated by everybody. They were attacked by all the retailers. And finally, the Supreme Court said, you're right. Resale price maintenance laws are unconstitutional. And since the 1960s, I think, I forget when this year, the year this passed, anyway, since the 1960s, discount housing has been, has been accepted. I mean, now everybody discounts, especially in New York. Uh, as a matter of fact, Corvette just went bankrupt a year or two ago because they had no other, they had no function. I mean, everybody was discounting. They were no longer a special place. <clears throat> um, so, uh, New York, by the way, are very fortunate. Most places in the country don't have these discounts. You don't have these electronic discount places and things like that. So, uh, so this is again an example of, of innovation of retail, in this case the retail industry, fighting against, battling against compulsory cartels. Uh, they have to be compulsory in order to work at all and, and trying to, you know, breaking through this whole, uh, this whole crust of cartelism. <clears throat> um, there still is, uh, I think, I don't know how it is with vitamins now, but there used to be a very tight discount, anti-discounting for vitamins in the name of health. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, I used to get Theragram vitamins, which are which Squibb's Theragram, which is multiple vitamins. Of course, the list price those days, it might still be about 10 bucks, which is totally insane. So 
they were selling it for about six dollars. The market price about six. So I went into this drugstore, neighborhood drugstore, and I said, I like Thurgood. And he said, and he looked, he kind of looked at me and said, you live in the neighborhood. A strange question, you might think, to ask. <laughs> I said, yes. And he said, yes, yes, I, 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 I've seen you around. He then sold me the vitamins for, for six dollars instead of ten. In other words, what he was worried about, I might be a Gestapo member. In other words, a member of, like, of a secret police of, uh, whatever they call them, so the Federal Food and Drug, or the, the, whatever bureau in New York regulates the retail industry. To go around and make sure the vitamins are no, sold at no less than list price. In other words, minimum price control uh, espionage agents. At the behest, of course, of the retailers, the organized retailers, the cartel, which doesn't want any given retail store to bust the price. So, of course, this is now busted. Man. Nobody sells for nine. I've never seen any Thurgood for nine, ten dollars. It's all about five or six. So, the, that too was busted. But it's int intriguing that even in New York here, we had a situation where you have to make sure the guy is safe, that I'm a neighborhood person, not some floating spy for the the local bureau. So uh, anyway, this is um, now, of course, they're discounts all over in vitamins. But uh, this is still going off of the liquor business, the liquor trust. Uh, it's been loosened a little bit recently. But basically, what you have is the liquor industry, liquor, liquor retail liquor store, tightly su the supply is tightly controlled. Uh, you have to get a license. First of all, there are no new liquor licenses, so it's very much like the taxi business, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, there are only a fixed amount of retail liquor store licenses. Since they don't issue any more, in order to get it to, in order, suppose you want to open up a liquor store, you can only do it by buying some other existing liquor store's license. Some liquor store owner wants to retire, go out of business, or sell out. You have to buy his liquor license. So it costs, you know, many thousands of dollars, whatever it is, an enormous amount of money. To be able to open up, to have the right to open up a liquor store. So, in other words, the supply of liquor stores is rigidly fixed. This, of course, raises the price, obviously. In addition to that, there's minimum distance requirements. In other words, you can't open a liquor store less than 100 yards or 200 yards, or whatever, from some other liquor store, giving this existing liquor store some crummy geographical monopoly of three blocks, or whatever. It was important in New York. Three blocks is a lot. Right? So, in other words, you can't invade his turf. So again, it's a pure cart. It's not, it's not true of any other, any other business, of course. You can, you can open up a grocery store right across the street from another one. But in the case of a, you know, a clothing store or whatever, in the case of liquor, however, it's specially regulated by the New York State Liquor Authority. And uh, so you've got geographical monopoly. When I first moved into my neighborhood on the west side, there was, a, there was one big liquor, liquor store here. There's another fairly large one there. There's a, there's a teeny, lovable teeny one right here, right next door to me. The teeny one was put out of business by these two guys that got together, complained to the liquor authority that was less than 100 yards or whatever it is from the other two. And they were put out of business. They were, just, they were expelled from, ejected from business by the state, by the state government at the, at the, uh, under the lobbying of these two competitors. This is the way, this is the way, this is the welfare state in action. <laughs> this, is, this is the welfare state. This is the government regulation for the common good, quote unquote. It's the government being used by these two competitors to screw their own, their third competitor, too. To cartelize the system, keep out competition. So that's where that's the real monopoly problem. The real monopoly problem is not a falling demand curve. The real monopoly problem, which everybody has, the real monopoly problem is the government being used to to uh, restrict or eliminate competition. <coughs> um, the um, and the liquor field, by the way, you also have, of course, very high liquor taxes plus liquor import controls. And the result of which is the price of liquor is enormously higher than it would be in the free market. It's incredible. I mean, I, I, it would be I, the price of liquor before the Civil War, when, when extra liquor taxes came in because of the prohibitionists. Um, a gallon of top scotch you can get for about a buck, and that's of course, let's say the price is now eight, eight times higher than that. You probably get a, a gallon of top Chivas Regal or something about for about eight dollars, I would think, on the free market. Yeah. Without the taxes, I would think it would be something like that. Yeah. Hmm? On the free market, I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about without taxes, without import tariffs. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay, so I'll leave you with that happy thought. <laughs> okay, take, let's take a 10 minute break. Please. Uh, a liquor store, like, liquor license is the same status as a liquor store license, same status as a Tobacco farm license and also a taxi license. We get to one of my favorite examples, a great taxi caper, which is now in the, in the news. Um, in, uh, if I've said this before, I'll repeat it on the taxi question. The, um, in the 1920s, there were 25,000 taxis on the streets of New York. Right? 
Um, and uh, in order to get a taxi, in order to get a taxi license, you had to be licensed. But all you needed to do is be able to show you could drive a car. Uh, so you needed a driver's license plus uh, you know, a car. You had to access to a car. And then you, you went downtown and got a 10 buck license. And the license is then you're in business and you operate a taxi. Uh, in the 1930s, the number of taxis went down from 25,000 during the boom of the 20s to 11,787. <clears throat> in 1937, the taxi owners in New York, the Associated Taxi Association, went to New York City and said, we need some help in the Great Depression. We need to be bailed out. And the help was <clears throat> that the New York City government said, okay, from now on, we issue no further taxi licenses. Now, from that day, from 1937 until 1986, that's 39 years, no more taxi licenses have been issued in the city of New York. That's it. The number of taxi licenses has been frozen, like the, by divine edict, in 1937, has never increased since. There we sit. Greatest boom in American history, tremendous boom in income and employment, whatever. We still have the same, same number of cabs on the street now that we had in 1937. Even though, of course, income is going up, population in New York City is not going up, but population in suburbs is going way up. There are a lot more people trying to get cabs. So you have then a freezing of supply at the old level, and therefore can't, would it ordinarily, of course, have gone up. And so what you're really doing is you're restricting the supply and raising the price, <clears throat> keeping the supply at the 1937 level. So I guess it's as if saying, well, the supply of cars is now, or the supply of bread is now 1937 level, and that's it. So. <clears throat> In order to get a taxi license now, if you want to own a taxi in New York, you have not only to buy a car and then, you know, get it and, be, and be able to drive, you also have to buy a taxi license from some existing taxi owner who wants to leave the business. Because you, you can't get any more from the city. That's it. Frozen, 11787 So, there's a, uh, a market, I hesitate to say free market, there's a market in taxi licenses, so-called medallion, which is a shield on the hood of the car. So, if you want to own a taxi, you have to buy a license for some guy who's willing to retire and wants to go on to some other business. And the price has been fluctuating. Of course, in the 1930s, the price was somewhere near $10. There wasn't a big demand to be in the taxi business. But after World War II, when the boom began, uh, uh, people wanted to enter it, and so the price uh, demand curve for this is taxi licenses. Uh, the supply, as Miller says, is frozen 11,787, and so the demand fluctuates. It's like an art, the art market, like the demand for Rembrandts. You know, the supply of Rembrandts is fixed because Rembrandt is dead. And the supply of taxis is fixed because the goddamn city government won't issue any more licenses. And so we have a fluctuating demand in accordance with all sorts of things, booms and recessions and whatever. Well, the price of a taxi license, well, Miller says the price of a taxi license in the mid-1980s is $60,000. He's way out of date already. The price of a taxi license right now on the market is $105,000. It means if you want to own a cab, and many people are cab drivers, it's also a good immigrant, a way for immigrants to, to start making a living here. As you well know, if you've seen, if you've driven, ta ridden in taxis in New York, most people don't know English anymore. Most of the taxi drivers, the huh, can't drive either very well. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> but you have to you have to buy, you have to get the, the, the most important thing is to be able to cough up the hundred and five thousand dollars to buy the taxi. And many of these drivers, of course, are are employees of fleets, but many of them, most of them, are, are taxi owners. And so there we sit. You have to the the, the market price of a taxi license in Medan is now one hundred and five thousand dollars. And of course, the result of this is the tremendous shortage of, of cabs. In other words, a tremendous scarcity of cabs. Uh, rates are up. The price is higher than it would have been. And the supply is way down. This means, of course, the taxi driver is in the saddle just like the, the rent control landlord is or the butcher under price control. Namely, that if it's raining, if it's rush hour, the, cat, no cat, the cats put their off duty signs on right? as, as a thrust on the gut of every, every consumer, right? So called off duty sign. And that's it. You can't find a cab any place. Um, the cab drivers don't, don't want to go to Brooklyn. They won't go to the Bronx. They won't go to Harlem. They want to, they want to hang around Midtown Manhattan where they maximize their income because they, there's no competition. The result of all this was the, was the growth of the so-called gypsy cab movement, the unlicensed cab, Ill illegal cab market. And then the gypsy cabs became quasi-legal. I think there's three tiers now. There's the gypsy cabs, which are sort of legal now. There's the illegal illegals, and there's the legal illegals. <laughs> and there's the, 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 the medallion cabs. The medallion taxis are the only ones that can officially cruise and pick up... Uh, 
pick up customers. Other cabs can have been allocated Brooklyn, the Bronx, and, and, and whatever, aside from Manhattan. <clears throat> um, they're basically allowed to cruise in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Uh, and, uh, and, and still others can, can, you can call them up, you know, the radio cash, you can call them up and, call, and that's okay, but they can't cruise. Now, of course, in real life, they do cruise from time to time, illegally. So this whole structure, this crazy structure of the taxi industry, all due to the fact that the licenses are, no new licenses have been issued since 1937, but 30, what is it, 49, 49 years, is it? yeah, 39 years, is it? Yeah, 49 years of the no new ta cash taxi license. Every few years, Mayor Koch has tried to increase the number. Like, let's have a hundred more, and the taxi and the taxi drivers are you know, going on strike. They, 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 big hysteria. Uh, yeah, what, what, I, I'm not sure. What was the thing yesterday? It tied up. Uh, higher rates. Higher rates, great. It's, it's, yeah. So, <laughs> and what's happened in the taxi business is interesting. This is, happens with all, mon all monopolists in many ways. I said in the long run, all monopolies are inefficient. In the case of a license, the like the market, and I'll go into this more when we get a little bit later on, uh, next week or two, we get you know, the, what determines the actual price and the market price of, of this kind of license. We have a monopoly price, a monopoly, a monopoly license like of this sort. The price on the market tends to absorb the monopoly profits. In other words, if, it's, if, if you get a big profit from owning a cab, you get, getting a license, the, the price of the license goes up to absorb the profit. So that means that the current guy, the guy who spends $105,000 on a cab, he spends so much for the cab, he doesn't feel he's exploiting the public. His profit margin is pretty low because he has to, he has to, it's true he's getting monopoly profits because he's keeping out other cabs. On the other hand, he has to pay so much for the damn license that absorbs his monopoly profits. So the taxi owners don't think they're exploiting us because they say, well, our profits are low. We're struggling to keep alive, which is true because they have to pay so much for their monopoly license. The result of all of this is the only people who really benefit the taxi monopoly is the original guys, the guys in 1937 who bought a license for 10 bucks and sold it for 105,000. They are the windfall, so-called windfall gainers. The guys who hung on to that license for 30 years, they're in great shape. The guys, the newcomers, however, are no better off than anybody else. The result, this kind of system benefits no one and screws up a lot of people. In other words, the consumers are screwed. The people who like to enter the taxi industry and can't because they have to call for 105,000 or borrow 105,000 to get the scratched and to, to get the license are, are hurt. And even the beneficiaries don't really benefit anymore. In the long run, in other words, the, even the monopolists don't benefit because their, their profits were absorbed in the price of the license they had to buy. And yet they'll fight like hell to keep it because they have $105,000 tied up. In other words, they will fight like tigers to keep any, mo any more medallions from being issued because they're afraid the whole 105000 will go back to 10 bucks where it should be in the first place. And it's the same argument, I don't know if I mentioned this in this class or not, but the same argument, same thing happened under slavery before the Civil War. In other words, in the economics of slavery, the slave was a, was a capital equipment. He was getting, the slave master was getting monopoly profits. <clears throat> in other words, essentially, as we'll see in a week or so, the, in the free market, everybody gets their marginal productivity. Everybody gets more or less, the wage rate is equal to marginal productivity. In the case of, the sla of slavery, the slave master picked up all of the, the in other words, he, he collected, so to speak, the productivity, and he paid the slave only subsistence, you know, just about enough to keep going and reproduce. And the difference was the surplus profit, in other words, the, the surplus value of the exploit, exploitation value, so to speak. Well, the slave master, you think the slave master would be making a lot of money because they'd be getting these extra profits from exploiting the slaves. However, after a few decades, what happened was the, the slavery, slaves were bought and sold, and so the price of the slave absorbed the monopoly, the, 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 the slavery profits. The slave master had to pay so much for the slave, had so much capital tied up in the slave, he felt he wasn't getting any extra profit. He was struggling like, every, like everybody else. The result of all this is the slavery system did not benefit anybody, even the slave master. But the slave masters fought like hell to keep it because they had all this money tied up in slavery. It's very much like the taxi industry, of course, much, much more important you know, economic consequences and political consequences under slavery, but the same economic aspect to it. In other words, you have an exploitative system, a monopoly type system, we are screwing a whole bunch of people to get monopoly profits, and yet the monopoly profits are, bit of, are discounted away by the market, so you wind up with no extra benefits. <clears throat> so the people who benefit of the initial slave, the guys like the slave traders who bought the slaves over and, and reaped the, uh, possibly reaped the big profit. But after a while, the slave profits were absorbed in the price of the slave. <clears throat> so <clears throat> yet, of course, they fought like hell to keep it. It's a very similar kind of system. Well. Uh, so every once in a while, the mayor, whichever mayor, has been saying, let's, let's increase the number of, uh, number of licenses by 100. 
and a big hysteria goes up. It means you're loosening up this, this monopoly system. Well, last year, about two years ago, Koch had a pretty interesting idea. He said, well, here's what he proposed to do in order to, in order to quiet down the hysterical taxi owners. Uh, give them a free license. In other words, you double the, the amount, so double this amount, okay, 23,000 or whatever, but you give each existing license owner one more license free, and the proviso has to be used either by him or by somebody else within a year or two years. So in other words, he'll have to sell it. Um, now, probably these guys would have benefited because they're getting a free, you know, you know, three hundred and five thousand dollars thing. It's true the price would have gone down from one hundred and five thousand, but still in all, they probably would have benefited. They were so scared about loosening up this tight monopoly and, and, and reducing the value, one hundred five thousand dollars value, that they fought hysterically against it. And finally, Koch had to withdraw the suggestion. The idea of giving every existing owner a free, uh, free, a free medallion, which has to be used. So this is the current situation. Now, uh, the current cookery thing came about. Uh, they decided a few years ago to take to issue a hundred, just a hundred, okay, a hundred extra medallions to use experimentally in diesel cabs to see how diesel cabs work. Well, of course, what happened was these, these crooks took the hundred, and and uh, each each one was in those days worth sixty thousand. That's six million dollars, and somehow nobody knows what happened to it. <laughs> they got dissipated away in various crooks on the taxi commission. But anyway, <laughs> so you can imagine this is an enormous amount of money here. Now, 11,000 medallions, 105,000 dollars each. It's a lot of dough. So there's there's where we sit, and, and it's interesting how the market discounts these uh, these uh, extra profits. So uh, the price has been going way up, and of course they're all very happy about this. And they're all, uh, they're all Clinging to every 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 buck they can in this, this situation. Uh, <clears throat> and most most cities have a one taxi monopoly or other. Los Angeles, you have to be a yellow cab company. They have a literal monopoly. Only the yellow cab companies are allowed to have cabs on the street. And that's it. The only really free market or semi-free market taxi situation is in Washington. If you've ever been to Washington, it's a magnificent taxi town. Even in rush hour, you can get a cab everywhere. It's magnificent. It's great. Because of free entry into the taxi business, no medallion, no nothing. It's true that the rates are regulated, but even so, uh, there's a big difference. <clears throat> one of the things about the rates is, by the way, one of the reasons why the, the gypsy cabs are now quasi-legal is because they don't cut the fare. In other words, they, 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 they're they finally grudgingly accepted by the medallion taxi people because they don't, the fare, they don't, they don't undercut the fare. If they undercut the fare, they'd probably be beaten up and be war on the streets. But since they don't undercut the fare, they're allowed to continue under these restrictions. <clears throat> so that's the, uh, that's the, we'll never get a really decent cab service in New York until the taxi monopoly is broken. So we get free entry in the taxi business. I, don't, I doubt whether it'll ever happen. I have to really buy these guys off. They refuse to be bought off, even as I say, even one free medallion didn't do it. Mm. So uh, <laughs> that's, the, uh, <laughs> that's the current setup. Uh, <clears throat> The, um, by the way, buying them off, most economists say we should, they should be bought off. It's cheaper for the consumer to buy them off. In many cases, in the case of taxi people, they don't want to be bought off. They're afraid to be bought off. Yeah? Yeah, because it's, it's filled with crooks. But they, they'll replace it with something else. It doesn't mean they're going to eliminate them. No, the, the, the thing is, the, 11, the magic number of 11,787 is, is remaining. I mean, they're not talking about doing away with that, unfortunately. I'd love to see it. Maybe someday they'll be able to do it. But uh, the taxi, there's a, big, a vocal minority, a vocal pressure group, and uh, highly, you know, highly politic, politicized because their whole livelihood is wrapped up in the government here and keeping their monopoly. So that's, that's the real problem of monopoly. Once again, it's not a falling demand curve. It's this sort of stuff. You can't get into the taxi business unless you shell out 105 thousand dollars and somebody's already in it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Similar situation uh, is with medical licensing. It's more complicated. Uh, medical and hospital licensing, where uh, the really what the real the real uh, the real sticking point happened. The real difference occurred in, in hospital licensing, where medical schools and hospitals were brought under severe regulation around 1910. Uh, the uh, Abraham Flexner wrote a report for a medical education in 1910, was sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation um, and the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, his report was there are too many doctors. 
Now, Shui talked a little bit about the quality of education, but basically he's saying that too many the, 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 the income of each doctor is too low and should be higher, and the way to make it higher is to restrict the entry. And once again, the so we have a systematic situation where the entry supply curve is shifted to the left. Um, there were literally half the medical schools in the country were put out of business. They were not, and licenses were not renewed or not issued by the state governments. Each state set up a uh, medical board. The American Medical Association, the trade union of doctors, so to speak, was given the right to appoint the, 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 the people. In other words, if you have a state photography board, who, who, who's running it? It's an organized photographer, and they run it in a cartelizing manner, of course. Why else run it? So each state, the hospitals, the medical, license, medical schools were licensed by the state. The AMA had a right to appoint the people, and they, of course, put half of the schools out of business, period. Uh, by doing, in other words, they shifted the supply drastically to the left. The number of doctors per person is much lower in the United States than it is in, in most other countries, much lower than it was before 1910. And so you push the supply curve to the left, and you increase, tremendously increase, of course, the income of a, of a physician. Um, and uh, one of the things that was done, we have a, a, a cartel. Again, it's, in other words, the medical, medical field is an organized cartel, a compulsory cartel, uh, each state running it, uh, in uh, collaboration with the American Medical Association. Uh, what happens with a cartel is that, when, again, when you have a cartelist, Discrimination comes in. This is just it's very much like the butcher or the landlord. If you have the right to decide who should be in your apartment, if you have 50 people for every apartment, well, you, then you pick the guys you like. You pick the race you're interested in favor of or whatever. Same way with the medical profession. When the medical schools were pushed to the left and half of them were put out of business by the government, the doctors then decided, well, we're going to keep out people we don't like. Who they keep out? Blacks, women, and Jews. These are the three major groups that were forced out of medicine. Before 1910, there were a lot of black medical schools, a lot of female doctors. Uh, they were systematically put out of business by the government, the state governments. They were, all the black medical schools were put out of business being, quote, unqualified, unquote. Uh, the female schools, those that had female med medical students were put out of business. And so the whole, the whole thing shifted. Um, and WASPs basically took over the medical profession for decades. <clears throat> um, interestingly enough, the people who took over, and this has been... Economists have engaged in a study of this. Uh, in the medical profession, the most monopolistic part of the profession are those which are most connected with the hospitals, because the hospital is the key to this thing, uh, key to the monopoly control, hospital and medical school. So the more hospital-oriented a um, physician is, the more monopolistic his occupation. Surgeons, for example, are, are totally hospital-oriented. The surgeons are the most monopolistic. In other words, they charge the highest fees per Per, well, per income of the, of the customer. Uh, for example, dentists. Dentists are not monopolistic, basically, because they don't, they're not connected with hospitals. The dentist will charge more or less the same amount to anybody for pulling a tooth. Surgeons, however, take a Dun & Bradstreet report on the, on, the, on the income of the patient, and they, just, they, they charge the proportion of what they think they can get away with. In other words, uh, if the person is wealthy, it's just suck them a higher fee for the same append appendectomy or whatever. They can only do that because they're, they're associated with a hospital, which is basically with a monopolistic licensed institution. So uh, on the other hand, shrinks, well, most, mostly on hospital, more or less charge the same fees. I mean, with, within limits, uh, shrinks are basically uh, non-monopolistic in that sense. They, they charge more or less the same fee for everybody because they couldn't get away with charging more for rich, the wealthy person. They just go to another shrink. And with comp inter shrink competition will then do the job of making <laughs> making the price more or less uniform, but not with surgeons because they're, they're locked into a hospital situation. Uh, AMA, for example, you look at the, uh, the power rate lead of the American Medical Association, invariably the, the, those who are running the association are surgeons, not internal medicine, not eye doctors, whatever, surgeons. Uh, the editors in the Journal of the American Medical Association are surgeons, the heads of it. Why is that? It's not, it's not God ordained and has to be surgeons. The surgeons are the most monopolistic. They're in with the key of the monopoly, which is the hospital. Uh, and one of the things that are done with the shrinkage is you're keeping, you're getting blacks, women, and Jews out. You also get out competing therapies, those which don't fit in with orthodoxy. Now, I'm not taking it to stand one way or the other. I'm not a physician. I'm not taking a stand on therapy one way or the other. What I'm saying is there are competing therapies. Orthodox therapy is not the only therapy. And in recent years, there's been a lot more of this, by the way, in the last 10, 15 years, a cropping up of unorthodox therapy because there's been more competition in the medical field. You know, doctors are even advertising now. It's a magnificent step. They're forced to compete a little bit. 
which was unheard of, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It's considered unethical to advertise. In other words, the ethics of medicine is you should never compete. Don't take a client away, from, a patient away from another doctor, because that's competition. In other words, it's an enforced cartel. <clears throat> it's been breaking up the last few years. <clears throat> so uh, they put out of business competing therapies. In other words, uh, there was in, the, in those days, before 1910, there were two basic, two respectable forms of therapy. Uh, current, what's, no, what's now called medicine, which then was called allopathy, allopaths, the theory being that you, you cure diseases by massive doses of synthetic drugs to, to, to kill the germs. And other, there are other fields. Home, homeopathy was considered just as respectable for that. I would say about one-third or more physicians were homeopaths. The homeopaths had a very different theory. Uh, their theory was synthetic drugs are no good. You use natural herbs in minute doses. Well, I don't know. Who knows? But anyway, the thing is they had a good success rate, too. Their success rate was probably at least as good as the allopaths. They were put out of business. Every homeopathic medical school was destroyed by the, by the state government regulation after 1910. By the American Medical Association, who was your allopath, and therefore put the homeopaths out of business. In Europe, they still have a lot of homeopaths, a very respectable occupation. Uh, in the United States, however, they're, they've been put out of business by the government. And with allopathy, using the government to crush homeopathy. Uh, also, there are, other, there are other forms of path, natural path. Osteopaths used to be illegal and now in chiropractors finally made it, but it's a, it's a long struggle to get, to get legalized. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, also, of course, a lot of cancer, alleged cancer cures are, have been outlawed by the government, not on the basis that they do any harm, but on the basis that they're not effective. How do you know they're not effective? Well, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it should be up to the patient to decide things to make. There was a case on television a couple of weeks ago by Dr. Riccio. Dr. Riccio? Dr. Ricci. Rubici, I guess, yeah, a Romanian, a lovable Romanian doctor, about 85 years old, had a lot of cancer patients, doing a lot of good, apparently, at least the patients testified to that. His license was taken away from him by the state government, so they said his, his therapy was not effective, quote-unquote. Um, the other hand, you have a lot of butchery going on by Orthodox medicine, and they said, well, sorry, that's, uh, that's our mistake, it was the way it is. Uh, uh, that's, even though it's, <laughs> it's not considered ineffective, because that's the state of the art. That's the state of art and, art and get away with it. So uh, it seems to be a pretty, uh, pretty rum deal to outlaw a, a cure just because it's, quote, not effective, unquote, according to the government, not according to the, the patient. And so Laetrile is an outlaw, the use of the uh, use of life of the cure, whatever these, however good or bad they are, people should be able to take to, to buy them. Incidentally, look at the, the basic argument of the orthodox medicine. Look at the argument. They don't say it's, it's, these cures are harmful. What they say is they're not effective, and therefore they're wasting the patient's money. Imagine these goddamn doctors having the goal to claim that, that other cures are wasting patients' patients' money. They're much cheaper than orthodox medicine, much cheaper. Uh, <laughs> which, is the big, which is the big reason why they're being ex elite, declared illegal. They're very cheap. Natural herbs are cheap. The Rovici method is cheap. Laetrile is cheap. It's basically, basically orange pits. Um, orange pits? Almond pits. Peach pits. Peach pits. Apri apricot pits. That's it. Anyway, they're fairly cheap. <laughs> apricot pits are not that difficult to come by. <laughs> At any rate, they're cheap. And so, <laughs> since, and most people, 90% of the people who go to so called quack cures have already gone through orthodox medicine declared incurable. And they turn to these quack cures only as a last resort in most cases. So, there's a tremendous amount of gore of these people that say that they're wasting the consumer money. At any rate, um, so there we have it. We have uh, a lot of these people, a friend of mine claims he was cured of diabetes by taking a homeopathic herb. And the five, this, you have an herb of this much, like $3.50 of an herb, five-year supply of an herb. And that's it. He threw away his insulin, and that was it. So it's much cheaper. And less, of course, less side effects to boot. So at any rate, homeopathy should definitely be legal, whether it's good or bad. It should be, consumers should have a right to patronize it. <clears throat> uh, now, what, there's an interesting, inter 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 Interestingly enough, a method to the madness here. The allopaths, remember, express synthetic drugs. Synthetic drugs are expensive. Synthetic drugs also have to be discovered by, and the research has to be done in, into them by drug companies. And uh, we're well, therefore particularly interested in keeping, putting the natural herbs out of business. The, uh, remember I said the Flexner Report, Abraham Flexner, who wrote the report which changed medical education in this country, was not a doctor and he was not an educator. Oddly enough, so why did why did he get this big plum and signing on who should be out of business? 
His brother was Simon Flexner, who was a doctor, who was also head of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. The Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research has been pushing ever since synthetic drug research. Most of their money goes into synthetic drug research. The synthetic drug companies are heavily invested in by the Rockefeller family, Rockefeller interests. So now we begin to have a connection here. You have the Rockefeller drug interests <laughs> making a lot of money out of synthetic drugs. We have the Rockefeller Foundation, allegedly impartial, objective scientific outfit, pushing for outlawing of competitors to synthetic drugs. <laughs> and Rockefeller reaps the profits along with the drug cart along with the medical cartelists at the expense of the consumer population. I'm not saying that these, this, this is the economics of the situation. I'm not taking a stand for or against any of these therapies. What I'm saying is the consumer should be allowed to choose. That's the, at any rate. Um, the, uh, in the last few years, the medical monopoly has been, more, has been loosened a lot. There's been a big uh, increase of people going to medical school. There's been a loose, they've had to advertise. Uh, has been a loosening up of, of uh, one of the reasons was the medical prices of, of, of drugs and, and medicine and hospitals have been so high that competition has been coming in, paramedics and people like that, uh, holistic medicine, we think are much cheaper, and finally pushed back the monopoly stranglehold on medicine, to, to some extent, not completely, but it's been a lot, things are a lot better than they used to be. I remember when I first went out to California many years ago, and the dentists were advertising on the radio, it was really a culture shock, you know, go to... <laughs> Turn the radio on, go to Dr. So and so, you have cheap, cheap fillings for 10 bucks or whatever it is. Uh, and now, of course, there's a lot more of it. You got leaflets saying, you know, go to this hospital and go to this clinic. But it's a good thing, it shows there's just some competition at last in the medical field. <clears throat> so, anyway, the, pro the monopoly problem is not uh, falling the man curve, it's, it's compulsory cartelism. I just want to say a, final, a footnote on the farm question. Farm price supports, which again are cartelized uh, agriculture. And, the, and, the, and the, uh, the milk, you have the milk cartel, compulsory milk cartel, with, a, with restriction on supply and rate rise in price. Well, the milk people are still belly aching about the, the price isn't high enough, and, the, and it's overproduction, quote unquote. In other words, there's still too much being produced. In order to crush the, the, the milk industry, in order to cartelize the milk industry further, the federal government has just issued a ruling. Compulsory killing of a million dairy cows, a slaughter of them. Because if you do, it sounds like the 19, early 1930s. It's being done right now. In the name of quote free market unquote. Compulsory slaughter of dairy dairy cows is to push the to, to decrease the supply of milk and push up the price. This is a well, this is a welfare state in action, people, <laughs> right? For the welfare of the goddamn dairy interests, the expense of the rest of us. So interestingly enough, what's happening is as they're killing the dairy cows. Usually, there are two kinds of cows, the dairy cows and beef cattle, okay? The dairy cows are milked and the beef cattle are killed for meat. As they're killing the dairy cows, they're selling them for meat. So the, the, the beef cattle industry is going crazy. They're saying, hey, hey, it's a big it's overproduction of cattle because there's now too much meat coming on the market. Meat prices are falling <laughs> there's too much cattle coming on the market. So they're calling for stopping the slaughter of dairy cows. They don't care what they do with them. They're going to you know, disappear somewhere. They don't want them competing with the beef cattle on the meat market. Such is the situation. This is the latest, the latest, latest development. So I'll keep you apprised as the term goes on. <laughs> okay, not for today. 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 Goes on. <laughs>